Okay, what's up everyone? Uh, Goldie here. And I'm going to be going over the early slate here. Um, we have a split slate on a Friday. Uh, probably not going to be a normal occurrence throughout the season because you know, mostly we have, uh, we have Fridays um, as a, a full sort of night game slate or a night slate full of games. You know, whatever. Um, but today we've got some home openers, uh, notably in in Minnesota, I believe, potentially in Cleveland, maybe Philly and Baltimore as well. Uh, I mean, it, it could be all of these guys, which is why they're on the um, why they're on the early slate here. Uh, we do have a five gamer on the main, so eleven games total. Uh, we do have a short little two game turbo as well that we will not be going over um, but we're going to trial run getting up the early slate projections uh, here this morning so hopefully by the time you guys see this vid um, that projections will be uploaded on the site if not uh, I apologize we're, we're working <laughs> as as hard as we can in the background to um, to get all this all this kind of stuff going for you guys but uh, nevertheless Sheets should have uh, his stuff up, so if you do need projections for a a, a solid six gamer here, um, you know if uh, if these ones are are not there, you know feel free to use kind of a combination of of sheets and uh, Saber Sims projections. They will uh, be available to you. Um, but if they are there, ignore everything I just said. So. Uh, that said, we're going to uh, quickly get into these. Not totally sure who the Yankees are going to end up throwing today. I don't believe that they have uh, officially announced a starter. Now, um, most of the industry looks like they're projecting Clark Schmidt, and it probably probably will be him um, until they get all of their, basically their entire start, starting rotation uh, back off the DL. Um so I, I think that's who who's going. I mean, Labs has him projected here. Fangraphs has him projected, um, as does uh, DraftKings, right? So, you know, they, they may do something screwy and just, like, run a bullpen game out here or something. But, uh, I mean, it'll effectively be a bullpen game anyway because Clark Schmidt, he's probably not going to go very deep into the game. Um, he got beat up a little bit in his last start, uh, I believe, against... Philly, I could be making that up, but uh, nevertheless, um, that's really the only question mark we've got as far as starters on the mound here today. Everybody else uh, is announced and um, should be ready to go. So let's uh, we're gonna try and cre keep this quick um, because I, I I'm gonna try and go over the main slate as well today. So uh, let's just get into it. Um, you can see right here we do have some initial ownership figures. Uh, coming in on a couple of guys, maybe a little stiff. Uh, Clark Schmidt, not one of them. 6,400, don't think you can play him here, like Baltimore, uh, a pretty decent bit. They're expensive, and they're going to be hard to get to. Um, don't have them in the in, in the sheet here, but uh, you can see 57 for Cedric, 52 for Rutch, 48, 48 for Santander and Mountcastle, respectively. Uh, the guys down here at the cheap at the bottom of the lineup are cheap, and they can make it a little bit more attainable here. Um Clark Schmidt, he's got some strikeout stuff, but once again, he's a bullpen arm for the most part, just giving him a look in the rotation to kind of break things up a little bit and and act as a stopgap uh, until they get their the Rodones and, and, and everybody else healthy um, for the Yankees. So does have some K stuff against right-handers, but Baltimore's going to be able to platoon here pretty well. Um Kind of takes me off of Mount Castle a little bit. He's he'll strike out, but uh, yeah, you can stack Baltimore here. I think I think this is a pretty good spot for the Birds um, going after Clark Schmidt. Now, generally, we don't like to target the Yankees in their bullpen, but um, it, it that's because you know their starters are are usually pretty good and their bullpen's pretty good. But um, you know we're removing a starter effectively and putting in a bullpen arm as the starter, so it's a little bit more attainable to go after them here. And in Clark Schmidt's first start, I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but he got um, he got beat up pretty good. 
um, if uh, if memory serves. So uh, we want to get to him with lefties for sure, and these are definitely worrisome numbers. 283 average, 369 WOBA, 228 ISO to the left side, just a 22.5% K rate. So about league average there. Walk rate worrisome for sure at 11%, and hard contact to both sides of the plate. This does make Mount Castle playable um, because with a hard contact of north of 33%, pushing 34 for two both sides, that with no real soft contact uh, induced, especially to the left side, uh, that makes uh, Clark Schmidt very attackable here. So um, if if he can only go a couple innings and, and Baltimore gets to him, we're not terribly worried about going after the Yankees, uh, the Yankees bullpen, that is. So you can get to some Baltimore here. They've had a very good start to the season. Um, maybe stifled a little bit in the last couple of games, but uh, you know nothing to worry about here for Baltimore. This, this is going to be a fun lineup to play all season. There's a lot of upside for these guys. Um, on the other side, Dean Kramer on the mound. Like this is a really interesting price tag for here for Dean Kramer here. And now I don't want to go after the Yankees with somebody that has a 17% K rate in aggregate, but he suppresses contact pretty well. Um, hard contact is a little bit worrisome, north of 30% to both sides of the plate, but the the numbers overall are pretty average, especially with somebody that pitches to a full 80% 80, 80 contact rate with just a 17% a K rate. 10% swinging strikes, has some good chase in him at north of 31%, and throw strike one, so he's not going to put people on base, and the four-seamer cutter mix is actually very profitable for him and very equitable. So um, it's reasonable that at 6,100, you could see Dean Kramer pop for a decent decent start here. And uh, point per dollar wise, he at, at least in the cheap range, um, he's one of the better. He's definitely the better play of all the cheap guys here on the early slate today. So. Um, if you are building very expensive stacks and need to get to a contrarian pitcher, if you're uh, if you're clowning around with some you know like Orioles and White Sox stacks or something where you just got to pay for everybody, um, you know Dean Kramer could unlock that. Not saying that's a necessarily a viable construction today, but um, you know just as an illustration, if you if you need this to to save some. Uh, on the mound, and you want to get to like a Hunter Green with a Dean Kramer, um, or something like Alex Cobb with a Dean Kramer, uh, you, you could do that, and and you could pay for some expensive hitters, because uh, I think getting to some expensive stacks today could be warranted. Uh, certainly, the White Sox will get to them in a little bit, um, but generally, no, I don't, I don't want to be playing Dean Kramer. I just don't think the upside is there. There is upside for him at this price to pop for about 15, 16 points, something like that. Um, on today's pitching slate, you might need a little bit more. I think there are some good arms that uh, that could pop for north of 20 um, in a lot of scenarios here. So uh, you might, might not be able to get to this because the upside just might not be there for Kramer. But uh, just you know, similar to JoJo Gray and Kyle Freeland yesterday, there were outs for them to get there, and sure enough, they got there. So, um, at 6,100, it's an interesting price tag for him. And like I said, point per dollar wise, he he's going to pop at least in the early projection runs here for the early slate. Uh, it's going to be all right. Now you can stack the Yankees for sure against him because he's not going to throw past them, right? So you can get to everybody on the Yankees. Um, good price for DJ up here. He didn't really strike out a whole heck of a lot, and he's looked decent to, to start the season. Looks healthy again, and let's not forget that DJ won a batting title a couple seasons ago. Um, certainly has always hit well, going back to his Coors days, but, um, you know, he can rake as well. Uh, this game, of course, is in Baltimore, and Baltimore does play up, or play down power, and it plays as a bit more of a pitcher's park since they adjusted the dimensions. But, um, you know, does that matter to Aaron Judge and, and Rizzo and Stanton and Glaber? I mean, not really. So they're another one of these expensive stacks that you can get to. Ozzy Cabrera here, if he's in the list, he probably should be. Uh, we'll make it a little bit cheaper and more attainable to get to at 2500 I would not go near Aaron Hicks. He stinks. Um, so... I mean, there. I guess I suppose there's upside for him at 2200 because Dean Kramer's not going to strike him out. But uh, like Volpe here a little bit as a cheap shortstop play if you need it. Um, 
But the Yankees are viable to go after Dean Kramer. Not going to see a whole lot of ownership. Um, you know, certainly not compared to the White Sox, but they they will be popular because people have just like going after Dean Kramer and definitely with the Yankees. So um, let's move on to Cincy and Philly. Uh, pitching matchup here is pretty fantastic, I think. Hunter Green on the mound for the Reds, 7,600. Nice price tag. Probably a little aggressive, I would say, in the median projection here, just out of the gate, but it's not off by all that much, I don't think. Um, really, really good stuff here. Problem with Hunter Green is that he is on the barrel, and he gives up a boatload of hard contact, really to both sides of the plate, lefties and righties. He's very susceptible to getting on the barrel and, and giving up some fly balls. He's a heavy fly ball pitcher in aggregate an 060 ground ball to fly ball, and he gives up a in aggregate a 1.7, 1.8 homers per nine, and that's really to both sides of the plate. So he's vulnerable to lefties and righties, gives up power, 191 ISO to lefties, 210 ISO to righties. So despite the very significant um, and elevated strikeout rate, really, really good whiff stuff, doesn't walk people a whole hell of a lot, Certainly not because he's getting behind in the count, um, but, you know, 9% walk rate is it's slightly above league average. It's not horrible. Uh, with the swinging strikes at 14, called strikes leave a little bit to be desired. Um, so that, that sort of deflates his CSW to sub-30%, so a little worrisome um, in that regard. And the called strikes, you're just not going to get them because... <laughs> Most of the time, he's just throwing it right over the middle of the damn plate. So he does have, he has gas. Of course, he's touching triple digits, and he's looked very good early in the season so far. Uh, so you can play him definitely, and at 25, 20, you know, 30 percent ownership or so, um, you know, I think this is uh, very attainable to uh, to play some Hunter Green against the Phillies. Now, that's just a kind of a, a price and an upside play for him uh, on the other side with the Phillies you can stack against him too he's a popular pitcher on a short slate and you know, the Phillies are starting to get their legs under them here a little bit um, he's vulnerable as, as I mentioned Hunter Green to power and just like Great American uh, this is in Citizens Bank which is also uh, similar to Yankee Stadium a high school field so um, a little warm over in Philly today about 60 degrees uh, should be a good day for baseball. Nice weather, uh, and despite you know really attackable pitchers on the mound that we could play, uh, Hunter Green you can definitely get to with some power as well. So uh, these guys are expensive, and you're gonna have to pay for them. But really, it's just Trey Turner, and Kyle Schwarber, um, definitely JTR as well. But uh, Castellanos and and all the guys down here at the bottom of the lineup, they make it much more workable. So um, you can play both sides of the Reds and the or Hunter Green and the Phillies. On the other side, Zach Wheeler, I don't really want to go after him. Um, he got beat up and kind of hit around a little bit by Texas in his first start. But uh, he far and away leads in, in terms of um, consistency and raw upside on the mound today. 9400 I think the price tag's fine. And I think the projection, it may be a little bit, a little bit elevated, but... Uh, early season Zach Wheeler, we get, there's kind of some variance with him just in general, but um, he's he's going to be fine, and and you can play him for sure at uh, healthy ownership though, 50%. If you're getting to chalky Wheeler, try and differentiate with some of your hitters, and I think we can do that. We'll get to some of those stacks later on. Um, numbers all look great though, suppression's fine, all all sub three, Bucko. Five buck oh six whip doesn't walk people, and he's not on the barrel. Uh, just a you know an average seven and a half percent or so. Uh, nice ground ball rates here, and suppression metrics in terms of contact uh, are all great as well. So um, nothing to worry about here with Wheeler, even though he got you know dinged around a little bit uh, by Texas. The Reds are are still going to be pretty poor overall this season. However, they do have their guys healthy. And if you want to play a super off-the-board stack and stack against a very popular pitcher to get some leverage, you know, the Reds could be viable. It's not my favorite, but, uh, you know, and that's mostly because Johnny India up here at 4,900 makes it kind of hard to get to. But T.J. Friedel and Jake Fraley, um, as well as Jason Vossler over here, they've had really good starts to the season. 
continuing their their power numbers from last year. Tyler Stevenson healthy, and he's a good hitter as well. Now, Will Meyer's going to strike out a ton in this matchup, so I wouldn't be super excited about playing him. Spencer Steer's been uh, kind of off to a slow start also. So maybe a, a three-man if you want to get off of a little bit of Wheeler with like a Friedel, Fraley, and a Jason Bossler. That's very cheap, and th that would allow you to get to um, you know some of the more expensive arms. Not necessarily that you'd need to today, but if you want to run like a Gilbert and a Giolito or something like that, um, th that would you know, and and also get some pretty serious leverage off of Wheeler, that would make that attainable. Um, but once again, not my favorite play here. Uh, I think uh, mostly favoring pitching, but you can get to the Phillies. I definitely prefer them to the Reds as a stack, uh, maybe just a short stack of the Reds for leverage. Uh, Houston and Minnesota should be a good series here. I think there's two pretty decent baseball teams. Uh, Houston probably looking for a bounce. They were not very good and underperformed quite a bit against Detroit um, in their, uh, their recent series. So Josie Urquidy on the mound, and, uh, I don't really like playing Urquidy. Uh, he gives up too much power and has a sub 20% strikeout rate. So he's about two and a half, three ticks below league average in that regard. And he's on the barrel at a, a pretty respectable rate here at 9%. Um, you know, 4.0 ERA with a 4.30 XFIP, fine suppression metrics, throws strikes, so he doesn't put people on base, which makes him a little bit frustrating to stack against as a fly ball pitcher sometimes. But uh, the power numbers that he gives up cannot be ignored here. Against righties in particular, very vulnerable. 262 average, 336 Woba. Those numbers are slightly elevated. Not Nothing too terrible, however. It's the 205 ISO and the sub-20% strikeout rate. Full 2-0 homers per nine that he gives up to righties. So he's right on the on the barrel of the bat against right-handers, and he's very attackable in that regard. So uh, I think we can get to the Twins today. They've been kind of disappointing um, power numbers-wise early in the season, winning a lot of low-scoring games. Uh, but they had a, uh, a series in Miami, so we can't really expect a whole lot of offense from them just because of the, the size of Miami's ballpark, of course. But back to target field, I believe, once again in their home opener. Um, and... About 55 degrees, I think, or maybe just 50 uh, over here in Minnesota. So uh, the best hitting weather, but Josie Urquidy definitely attackable. And, and as long as it's not bad weather like we typically have in um, early April in Minnesota, then I think we can uh, we can get to maybe a little bit of, of offense here because Sonny Gray on the other side is definitely attackable as well. As we've talked about, there's variance with Sonny, and we don't want to go after the Astros just in general. They're not going to strike out, and they're going to be very, very good once again this season uh, until the Mariners or or maybe the Angels, definitely not the A's, uh, unseats them in the AL West. They're still the team to beat, So, um, and really in all of the AL. So this is going to be a very difficult team to attack in general this season similar to last year, and because Sonny has thrown so many freaking pitches here, um, that, that gives him a little bit of upside, because he still has, has some whiff stuff. It's not necessarily in the means of swinging strikes, of course, with just a 9% K rate, but he gets a lot of called strikes, and that keeps his CSW up toward 30% where we really want it. Um, not really susceptible. Maybe in the last couple of seasons, he's walking a few more people but uh, than he did earlier in his career, but Overall, doesn't put people on base. He throws strikes. When he's bad, though, he could be really bad. And But for the most part, Sonny's just kind of a, a middle-of-the-road average starter anymore. And the raw upside in good matchups is definitely there for him. Probably not today against Houston at 8,000. Um, at full 12% ownership, this seems like terribly high to me. Uh, I don't want to attack Houston pretty much ever. But... Um, you know, they have been a little disappointing here in the early going. So uh, it, it's not totally unreasonable, but at 12% at ownership on a six-game slate, I mean, it's really because it's only a six-game slate that this number is this high. But I still don't personally want uh, that much of Sonny Gray. Uh, I don't like going after the Astros. So um, that said, do I want to stack Houston? Well, you can always play Jordan. You can always play Kyle Tucker. And really, unfortunately, you know, that. 
Sonny has always been excellent against lefties. Uh, he's had very good strikeout numbers, kind of a, I don't want to call it a full reverse split, but um, definitely just markedly better numbers against lefties, certainly in the strikeout department and the power suppression. So that's persisting toward the latter years of his career, I suppose. Um, but not really attackable with the right side either. So the 12% ownership, like it's, it's it's understandable. It's personally, you know, for me, very too high, uh, very too high, too high. And um, I, I think I want to stay off of that a little bit. But it's mostly the price tag that uh, that makes me balk here. Um, I don't want to be paying 8,000 for a very high variance pitcher against a very good lineup. Uh, despite the fact that he, he suppresses contact. And uh, even on a short slate, I mean, you could play him. It's only a six-gamer, but uh, I am not going to be going crazy with Sonny Gray here. So prefer mostly offense and probably just the Twins. Uh, okay, Seattle and Cleveland. <clears throat> Logan Gilbert on the mound. Um, we love playing Logan Gilbert, but we also can attack Logan Gilbert. Um, similar to George Kirby, these guys... There's young pitchers for the Mariners. They've got good stuff and a lot of strikeout stuff, but George Kirby not or uh, Logan Gilbert, excuse me, not so much. And he should actually be significantly better to right-handers really than he is. He's pretty damn good against lefties. 202 average, 258 woba, buck 16 iso with a 27% K rate. Hard contact leaves a little bit on the table for him uh, and not inducing a whole hell of a lot of soft contact. As a, a slight fly ball lean guy, he's basically neutral. That's a little bit worrisome just in the hard contact and fly ball uh, arena. However, it's really the right side that we want to get to Logan Gilbert with. 272 average, that's definitely high. 329 woe, but not terrible because he's got good control, doesn't walk people. Certainly doesn't walk any right, he's just 5%. But a 174 ISO, sub 20% strikeout rate to same-handed hitters. So... Um, a little worrisome there, and an even higher hard contact rate to the right side, 36% into pitch info. So uh, 1.3 homers per nine, so it doesn't really translate necessarily to balls over the wall. Um, but Cleveland is a little bit more of a hitter's ballpark than is Seattle at night, where he is going to throw most of his games. This is a day game. It is just 45 degrees in Cleveland. I don't really pay attention to much wind under... 15 miles an hour. Um, so, I, but at 45 degrees, I mean, 45 degrees, 45 degrees, it's not great baseball weather. It's better pitching weather. So both of these guys, Aaron Savali and Logan Gilbert, are probably playable today. However, Logan Gilbert just gets a terrible matchup uh, in, in Cleveland in general. Now, you, as I just mentioned, we want to get to him with righties more than lefties. And Cleveland, unfortunately for them, they have so many lefties that – they can throw at him. Very few righties will actually be in the lineup. Uh, might be Zanino. He could get he could get to Logan Gilbert for sure. Um, that's always been Zanino's problem: swing and miss. Miles Straw. He'll probably be in there as well. Maybe a little bit of upside for him to at least get on base. Uh, but most of the other guys, they're going to hit from the left side. So while on the surface it does, it's like, well, we don't want to attack Cleveland. They've got a 17% aggregate K rate or whatever. Uh, against against righties, it, it might look a little bit better because Logan Gilbert can really get to lefties uh, and neutralize them pretty well. So um, I think Logan Gilbert at 8,700 is an interesting tournament play here. Definitely a 10% ownership. If you want to drop down to Gilbert off of Wheeler, I think this is playable. Uh, he may struggle a little bit just because the, the Guardians are, are so pesky. And a 10% delta between his K rate and the aggregate K rate for the Guardians at 17 and a half, uh, like that's that's a big number. So he could still struggle a little bit, but uh, I think the $8,700 price tag and 20% of 20% of the ownership that Wheeler is seeing, at least in the early runs here, I think that makes this a, a playable piece uh, because we do like Gilbert. He's he's got gas and he's got pretty good stuff. On the other side for Savali, um, he's throwing the kitchen sink as well. Mostly relies, however, on a three-pitch pa- three pitch fastball mix and uh, a pretty good curveball. So um, 
mixes up the arsenal pretty well, but, you know, throws in a slider change splitter, you know, throws all kinds of, you know, weird stuff here. Uh, and that makes him a serviceable starter as well. He's actually better in the strikeout department, similar to Gilbert against lefties. It does give up a little bit more power with some hard contact, 36% hard contact on the barrel a little bit to the lefties in a 175 ISO. So that's notable, but they don't hit for a lot of average. So it's mostly just balls in the air and, you know, balls down a line and stuff like that. A little more susceptible to righties in terms of average, but uh, average ISO, that is batting average, that is. Um, but an average ISO, average WOBA, and and fine hard contact number to the right side, 1.1 homers per nine. In aggregate, about 1.2 homers per nine uh, to both sides. So nothing really mega attackable here. If anything, it's it's with some lefties. And with Seattle, they can throw a couple of lefties at you. Um, you know, Cal Raleigh in particular, he'll probably be in the middle of the list today. 3,400, I think this is a pretty good catcher play if you need a one-off or something. Colton Wong, he's probably a bit expensive down in the six at 4,400. Not a lot of raw upside for him, but Jared Kelnick they can throw at you, as well as J.P. Crawford down at the bottom of the list. Not a ton of upside for Crawford necessarily, but Kelnick certainly has some pop and and could could get to Savali here. But once again, it's 45 degrees, not crazy about... Uh, playing offense here in general would prefer mostly getting to the pitching uh, with I mean 17% on Aaron Savali and just 10% on Logan Gilbert I think Gilbert is a better play just $400 more expensive you should be able even on a six game slate to find 400 uh, and and get to Gilbert if the choices between the two. So would prefer mostly pitching here but off the board stacks on a six game slate you can certainly play. Okay, White Sox and the Pirates. We have Giolito on the mound for the Sox. A um, little bit better, still a little bit on the barrel to the righties, so we need to see this calm down for Giolito. Um, but and overall, I like playing Baby Gio here um, at 25% K rate, still has the swinging strikes, and the called strikes are, eh, I mean, both of these numbers are fine. At uh, 12.5%, 17%, they're fine. They keep him at a 29% CSW, so there's still upside for him to attack weak lineups and and stay off of the barrel. Uh, definitely to lefties. His problem has been the righties and with a 308 average allowed. That's a, that's a big number. 386 Woba, 224 ISO, and a 1.7 homers per nine. Much better against lefties, 116 ISO, 29% K rate. So... The uh, the Pirates over here with O'Neill Cruz and uh, Brian Reynolds here at the top of the lineup. Um, of course, Carlos Santana, G. Ben Choi, they're going to hit from the left side as well. CSN down here at the bottom of the list. G1 Bay. Uh, Heineman behind the plate. They'll throw a lot of lefties at G. Lito, and that actually plays into plays into his, his hand a, a little bit more. Um his problems are to righty, so I think you can play Giolito as well at, at depressed ownership compared to Wheeler. Also, uh, I think this is perfectly fine at 8,900. It's a fine tournament play, and they're, you know, the the Pirates are still going to be you know, attackable um, with subpar batted ball matchups, and I think today in particular, uh, it, it's going to be a a bit of a, a subpar batted ball matchup. Uh, we're certainly seeing a lot of chalk on the white side. This is their lineup from yesterday. Haven't updated uh, quite yet. I don't think we have anything rolling in just yet, but um, this is mostly going to be their lineup, well, at least against lefties. They had Jake Berger and Hanser Alberto in there. Uh, Andrew Benintendi probably back up it at the top of the list or, or close to it. Um, against against righties but this may be pretty similar to what they roll out again against rich hill today so uh like jake berger and andrew vaughn definitely uh tim anderson and luis robert today they got price drops 55 for for tim and 51 now for luis robert so i think you can get to the white Sox, and well everybody else agrees right we're seeing 20 percent ownership on them so far in early runs and they're by far the uh, the chalkiest full stack uh going after rich hill today is that warranted it's fine you can attack rich hill for sure at 7100 i don't really want to play him uh because as we saw yesterday even though i thought alex wood was an okay play 
he they made him throw a lot of pitches, and he only lasted three innings. Um, so he was serviceable, but he, he got hit around a little bit, and the White Sox are going to make lefties work. Tim Anderson hits lefties, I mean, at one of the better clips in the league. Luis Robert does as well. Andrew Vaughn and Jake Berger both have a lot of power, and on the plus side of the split, Hanser Alberto may also be in the list again today. And a 2100 for him, if you want to make it, excuse me, a little bit cheaper, he's he's possible. You can play Elvis Andrews down at the bottom of the list. Uh, he's always hit lefties okay. And Romy Gonzalez, he has retooled the swing a little bit, uh, having come up last year and, and got a real good taste of the big leagues. Um, he's got some pop too. So you can run some wraparound stacks. If you are stacking the, the socks over here, you're going to have to get different with it against Rich Hill. Uh, I'm not sure I want to go after him a whole hell of a lot, um, he's, he's thrown a bunch of garbage here and with righties, you can, you can certainly get to him because he's vulnerable there in the average, a little bit, uh, 253 average, 328 Woba. It's not because of walk rate or anything like that. He's just pitches to contact anymore because he's not throwing it by anybody at just a 89, 90 mile an hour fastball anymore. So relying still mostly on the curveball, but throw strikes and, and doesn't, it isn't going to get torched. Uh, to the tune of you know six runs every outing or anything like that. Still good against lefties, 25% K rate over the last season and a half. Um, you know in his 40s now, so don't really want to go after him with any lefties. That means Benintendi, probably just leave him off your stack. Um, and it's mostly just the righties that you want to target here. But you can throw in Benintendi because if they do pummel Rich Hill a little bit they'll probably see a righty out of the bullpen, at which case that, that plays into to his positive split as well. So uh, you can get there, but he doesn't give up Rich Hill uh, a whole hell of a lot of fly ball contact to, at hard contact that is, uh, to the right side. He is a fly ball pitcher to righties with a little bit of power, uh, 195 ISO, but this isn't a, a horribly alarming number. So uh, at elevated ownership, uh, we saw yesterday with the, the Rockies and the Nationals both care, garnering a, a lot of ownership. Yeah, there's a variance in baseball, and if we, and there's a lot of risk that you assume when you just eat 20% uh, on a full stack. So um, keep that in mind. It's not to say that it's not a, a fine spot for them in general as a batted ball matchup. White Sox against lefties last season created at a very, very high clip, one of the better numbers in the league, 120 WRC+, plus, even though they didn't even – hit for a, a high ISO here, 336 Woba, just a 20% strikeout rate. So they will make guys work on the on the mound, and that certainly plays into uh, into their hand a little bit. So favorite plays over here probably be Jake Berger. He's got a crap load of power. He looks really good. Swing looked fantastic yesterday after they brought him up from the minors. Um Tim Anderson, definitely, at 55, but you're going to have to pay for these guys, and they're both going to be owned. So uh, those would be the favorite plays, but get different with it if you do stack the Pirates. Not bad, but uh, probably not my favorite stack of the day, to be honest. Uh, okay. Kansas City and San Francisco, last game here. Um, trying to get this done quickly because we are going to go over the main slate as well. Uh, Brad Keller on the mound for the Royals, and 6700 for for Keller. Once again, these cheap price tags for some of these generally low upside pitchers, they they can pop for 15, 18 points and on some of these short slates that could be all you need to to totally get there. Uh, as we saw yesterday, you know, you needed Gosman, of course, but um, you could have gotten there with Sale, who only put up 18. You could have gotten there with both of Kyle Freeland. He, he, he had a really good day. Uh, and Josiah Gray. At who only put up, I think, 18 points. So um, some of these cheaper pitchers, you can take shots on them because you're minimizing your risk and what you pay for them, and it allows you to get to uh, some contrarian constructions for sure. Certainly Keller's not going to be played. Um, but San Francisco, you know, I know they tore apart Lance Lynn yesterday, but he throws all fastballs. Uh, Brad Keller here, he doesn't have overwhelming stuff. And he relies on the four-seamer and the sinker to a pretty healthy clip, but he throws a slider a, a good bit. And this could be reasonable 
uh, a reasonable type of arsenal to go attack the Giants. Now, he has a high, high ground ball rate, and that's generally fantastic when we're playing in San Francisco. The ballpark at Oracle, I think it's Oracle now, yeah, uh, is a little bit smaller since they brought the fences in a couple of seasons ago. Um, and this is a day game, however, in San Francisco, I mean, 55 degrees, 55 degrees, and it's still a big ballpark, it's still overall a pitcher's park, uh, But even though it does play a little bit more favorably to hitters anymore and offense. Certainly during the day, when we get some of these games later in the, in the season, in the heart of the summer, uh, you're going to want to target offense in San Francisco. Maybe not today, however, I do think Keller could be a little bit serviceable we do have upside questions, of course. Just a 17% K rate, and he walks people. He has trouble throwing strike one, so he puts himself in really bad counts. He'd be a lot better if he could throw strike one, get ahead of hitters, and then get to a really plus slider here. Um, as it is, it doesn't provide him a whole lot of value relative to league average, but if he were ahead in the count more often, it would allow him to dictate when he throws the slider rather than having to throw the slider to try and bail him out. Uh, so I think that would make Keller a little bit better. Overall, he's kind of frustrating to stack against sometimes because he's got such a high ground ball rate. 1.7 to the left side, 1.9 nearly to the right side. So he doesn't give up a lot of power and doesn't give up a homers. Um, despite the fact that this is a pretty good batted ball matchup, as we saw yesterday. The Giants, they lift a baseball, man. And as a team, it, last year they had a, a neutral ground ball to fly ball. But this year, they're going to hit probably more fly balls than they will ground balls at a pretty significant clip, I would I would assume. Um, they will strike out still, 24% K rate. Of course, Keller's not going to blow it by them or anything. Um but guys like Lamont Wade, Jock Peterson, Michael Conforto got into a ball yesterday. He's like all them. They're still cheap and very attainable. Jock at 45, a little stiff, but uh, they're probably the the second most popular stack to the White Sox today. And once again, I, I generally don't like stacking against Brad Keller. Um, he's the the ground balls allow him to get outs a lot of the time, and. While this is a, a good batted ball matchup for the Giants, uh, I, I think it, it could be a little uh, a little bit smoke and mirrors. That said, it's a six-game slate, and this is not terribly elevated ownership for a six-game slate at just 15% in aggregate, aggregate, give or take. So it's fine to, to go after Keller because the Giants, having popped a little bit yesterday, uh, it was mostly in the homer department, so probably a, a little noisy. Uh, they could be waking up with the with the bats a little bit. So uh, it's reasonable to attack with them. If you want to play full correlation stacks with Alex Cobb, I think this is fine. It will reduce the um, your, I, I guess, vulnerability to the field a little bit because there will be more players playing full stacks of the Giants and more players playing just Alex Cobb than there will be you know, playing both of them. Um so Alex Cobb at 30%. I, I like this a lot at, at 7,400. I think this is a pretty good spot. We saw yesterday at Gosman tore apart the Royals uh, with the splitter. And, well, sure enough, Alex Cobb throws a really good splitter as well. Sinker-splitter combo with the curveball that he mixes in. And I think this is a very attackable lineup. Certainly a better and and more attackable lineup than was the Yankees for Alex Cobb in his first outing uh, where he survived, right? He doesn't walk people, has always had really good control. He'll get beat up and float the splitter and the curveball occasionally with the sinker. But for the most part, the best hitters uh, on the rows are actually coming from the left side. Of course, we have Salvi and Bobby Witt, but uh, Eddie Olivares, he'll hit from the right side. Um, he's a good hitter. But Vinny Pascantino, Michael Massey, and MJ, I mean, they're balanced over here. But most of their power is actually going to come from the uh, from the left side. And Alex Cobb, pretty damn good against lefties. 075 ISO with you know, the hit for some average, but no power whatsoever. He's got a killer ground ball rate. 3 to 1 ground ball to fly ball ratio, and it's huge to both sides. Uh, so I generally don't like attacking Alex Cobb, and I think this is a pretty good spot 
uh, for him on the mound. So if you want to play the Giants and, and Cobb, uh, go ahead. You're going to have to get different elsewhere because uh, you don't want to eat a chalk pitcher and a chalk stack necessarily unless you're doing something off the board. But uh, this is a good spot for Alex Cobb and a, and a good price tag here. So uh, I, I like the uh, like the Giants a little bit here. So that's it for the early slate breakdown. Um, quickly, we will go over stacks. You're going to have the White Sox and the Giants, of course, that we just talked about. They'll be there. They'll be your chalk, but you can get to a lot of a lot of different stuff here. You can play some of the Yankees against Dean Kramer. They'll probably be third in ownership, I would guess. But Baltimore against Clark Schmidt, who got beat up, uh, he's definite. Or the uh, the Orioles are, are definitely playable against him. Not so much in the way of stacks for Cincinnati. Um, Philly, you can target against Hunter Green. He'll give up some power, uh, like mostly pitching here. But um, you can play some sneaky offense. Once again, just a six-game slate. Uh, Houston and Minnesota, you can get to offense here. And probably no pitching for me. I don't like attacking Houston. And Josie Urquidy, uh, I like stacking against him uh, pretty often. So I like Minnesota in the game. And... You know, you could play some contrarian Houston stacks, looking for them to kind of get off the schneid a little bit. And if Sonny Gray's bad, he could be really bad. Um, like pitching here as well, but you could play some sneaky stacks because both of these guys can be vulnerable to same-handed hitters. Pretty good against guys that will platoon against them. Um, so I think you could play some Logan Gilbert at a reduced ownership to uh, Zach Wheeler up here. Seems fine. And Aaron Savali, probably not. I don't like attacking Seattle in general, but uh, he has outs here as well at an elevated ownership relative to Gilbert, at least. I'd probably just prefer to find a few hundred bucks and, and play Gilbert. Um, Giolito, you could play on the mound also. His power or problems are to the right side and not necessarily the left side. Pittsburgh is going to platoon a lot. So this is a good spot for Giolito as well. Um, and at reduced ownership, just 17% that we're showing on him at the moment. Uh, I think that's a good way to differentiate your White Sox stacks. Uh, you can also just play him solo. You don't have to play the White Sox here. You can play somebody else. And we just talked about uh, the Kansas, Kansas City and San Francisco game, mostly just the um, mostly just the Giants and and Cobb, but less so on the Giants for me personally. So that's it for the early slate. We are shortly going to get into the main slate. Once again, we do have early straight slate projections up on the site, and they should be pushing to Saver Sim as well. Uh, but let us know if you've got any problems. It's just kind of an early trial run trying to get both slates up here, at least for my projections. So that's where we stand, guys. Uh, good luck on the early if you are playing.